Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Alastair Adcroft uh, from Princeton University. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to the organizers, and thank you to Cavley um, for hosting us. Um, so I, as Lord just mentioned, I also sit at DFDL, which is this uh, little meet, uh, logo down here in the bottom, and uh, in fact, spent most of my time there. We've actually closed still. We're still working from home. Um, so this has been a new experience for me. It's the first time I've been in person, and it's Gosh, it's great. <laughs> I just had forgotten entirely what it's like. So it's great to see you all. I apologize if I get overexcited when I meet you. Um, so um, I'm going to first of all introduce um, the project that we're part of. Um, Lord did some introduction of this already today. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the project just for a bit of context. And then uh, talk about one of the game, uh, goals of this project, which is to implement machine learning in, in climate models, real climate models. And so we're going to talk about some of the issues associated with that exercise. And um, I, I'll review a few of the quantizations that we're already working on and planning to get in, into. Um, I apologize, it's gonna be slightly different to what you've just been listening to over about machine learning for the last day. Um, but it is nevertheless part of what we have to um, consider when we're doing this exercise. So M squared lines is a big project and it has the goal of trying to improve um, the surface fields or climate models in general. Um, which and these areas in the surface fields are due to um, a poor representation of physics and a uh, lack of resolution, um, poor parameterizations, missing physics, numerics, all as Law described earlier this, mo um, this morning. And so our goal is to develop new data-driven parameterizations that will improve the representation of physics and also to reduce the structural error in those models. And this is all to be implemented in real existing climate models. So we have this sort of uh, framework or, or structure for the project, which is, a, is an image you saw earlier today from law, where we have um, several th uh, two kind of themes where there's a high resolution modeling development of, of um, uh, uh, physics, improved physics. And we also have a data simulation theme, which I'm not gonna do, talk about today at all, um, where we are going to try and learn from real observations and the data simulation systems we use these models with to, to infer um, uh, uh, unknown errors and fix the models. And they all come together in these sort of physics aware, data-driven machine learned uh, models that we want to develop. They are going to be correcting the, the, the representation of the physics and structural errors. And there is a goal for us to be able to interpret what we're doing because we want to understand what we're doing. And at the end of all of this, there is this little bo bo box here, which is the implementation and evaluation. And we're going to spend the whole next half hour talking just about that. In reality, it's not a little box. It really affects everything in front of it. And it's absolutely key for the last part, which is actually improving the models. So, so that's why we're going to talk about it. So the models, um, we've got three existing climate models, which we're actually addressing. There's the GF, those are from NOAA GFDL, um, SPEAR, CM4, and ESM4, which are different resolutions and classes of model. We've got CSM. Two from NCAR um, in the US. And then in France, we've also got the CM6 IPSL model. And we have um, 11 institutions involved, US and Europe, several climate centers, and we have representatives from all those centers and um, representatives from um, developers or experts in the various components in these models to help go through this exercise. These are all used in AR6, um, so you know, they are the real thing, real McCoy. And as I said, there are a data assimilation aspect and a high resolution aspect to the, to the development process, um, which address different parts of the systems um, in different ways. But we are aiming to implement everything that we are doing in all of, the, all of the components that we have access to. So that statement alone has put some constraints on what we're doing, um, because we want to be able to implement this in different contexts at different resolutions and in different background states and climates. We have to have uh, models which are transferable, scale aware, and generalizable. It's a big project. That's the team. You saw these bullet, these um, bubbles uh, earlier today. Um, so just this, just to emphasize that basically I had nothing to do with any of this. It's all this, these people here, led by Law, Lawzana. And here's the beginning of the problem I want to discuss. So. Initially, if you're looking at this from the outside, you're going to say, well, I've got these big climate models. I want to improve them. Look at them, found a million lines of code, at least for CM4. I learned today that um, someone else's model was one and a half million. That's a lot of code. 
Um, it's in a, a somewhat antique language, although that's sort of unfair because there's a modern form of Fortran. Um, but there is decades of experience behind those codes. And that institutional memory is like the pre-trained neural networks, right? I mean, that's, that stuff matters. It's, it's absolutely essential for building models. And one other aspect about them is they almost exclusively run on CPUs. In fact, the hardware that we have available in the next, well now and in the next few years will actually be CPU. Um, our, my climate model does not even, we don't have access to a GPU to run the model on in, in the first place. It doesn't run on GPUs either. Now in contrast, we've had all this exciting development this morning. We heard about applying machine learning to learn some subgrid models. And you do that in probably about 50 lines of Python, right? So there's a major contrast between, you know, this is really elegant because of all of the work that went into developing the libraries that you're doing the machine learning with. You have 50 lines of, code of, of Python. Now, how on earth are you going to call that from your that million line, line um, Fortran code? So apparently there is, a, there is a language barrier. And so this is just a, a setup because really it's not the biggest barrier. There are already solutions out there. Uh, three that we have evaluated already is Recode in Fortran. Um, this is a solution that Otto et al. have used in the Fortran Keras Bridge works uh, for certain kinds of network. Maybe there's a sustainability issue because of evolving architectures, but um, <laughs> evolving machine learning network architectures, I mean. Um, another option is just to follow the, the manual for Python, which shows you how to embed Python in other languages. And so this has been evaluated by IT folks at um, NYU and at GFPL, and also by Noah Brenovich, who's written a nice blog about how to do all of this. And you literally just write a, a little layer, use a C API, and you can call that. Um, you have to do a lot of work yourself. Another option is to use a turnkey package. So APE, um, Trey Labs, have a product called SmartSim. Um, it's a paper been submitted by Party et al. And NCAR have actually implemented some machine learning in my ocean model um, using this package. So it works. Um, and the, the nice thing about this is it's, it's taken all of the hard work of developing either the Fortran codes or interfaces. It's been done for you. Um, and it has the advantage that it can actually uh, bridge that CPU, GPU gap if you have GPUs available. So there are solutions, but this is really just the beginning of the problems with actually working with climate codes. So the language part of it, let's just call that a wrap. Um, and move on. Oh, by the, um, uh, uh, there will be there will be more solutions along these lines coming down the pipe, inevitably, because this is a problem that needs to be addressed uh, cleanly. So there are other problems to do with climate codes, which are not to do with language. Um, a lot of the, well, I, we said that there's a million lines of code, and those those codes were developed by different people with different styles, different backgrounds, different training different purposes. And so the models, the components, and each process within those components is written by someone different, and they have their own style of setting up data and defining things. And um, not only is that done at the code level, but even in the formulation from an equation point of view. So we have inconsistencies. This may shock those of you who are not climate modelers, but we actually have inconsistency between the equations and the variables we use within the same code. It's, it's inevitable when you have um, parameterization development done in one place and models running in another place that you're going to have um, somebody choosing to use one variable such as, in my the example I gave, is practical salinity, but the model is written with a new equation set using absolute salinity. That probably means nothing to you, but these details matter. In the atmosphere, they lead to such big errors that we have to have, and I'll say this quietly, energy fixes, because this is the source of some of the problems we have in conserving models is the inconsistencies in the, way, in the use of variables and in the use of the, 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 um, the tendencies, the kind of def definitions of what they're actually asking for. And another aspect about the formulation, which has come to light recently, but it's, it's, been, it's been there for a while, is that we have a wide range of vertical coordinates in our systems. And the models themselves vary between, you know, from model to model. So some might use a hybrid coordinate, some might use a terrain following coordinate. And if you develop a parameterization, you need to know which one you're going to be in and make sure it works in both. Even, um, so that was actually the second point there, but even within one model, you might have a variation in your coordinate from one column to the next. And what in particular in the atmosphere, this is something I didn't realize until recently, they actually change coordinates between dynamics and, and physics. So thermodynamics are done in one 
on one grid and are very often the dynamics are done on another. So we've got all of these changes of coordinates and you need to make sure that you're, you're um, aware of that when you're developing a parameterization. These issues are true even for conventional parameterization. So this is not new, okay? In fact, much of what I'm gonna say is still, still applicable to conventional parameterization. So we've, you know, they've been addressed before to some degree. One new one, which um, is coming, coming more of a problem is parallelism. So parallelism is something we deal with all the time. We have MPI codes, we decompose our models normally in the horizontal directions, and you know, we just tile a model. We, we know how to send information around. But a lot of the physics, the so-called physics, which is really the parameterizations, it's, a, it's a, the jargon we use, the parameterizations we call it physics, have been developed to be, say, single column, or the, you know, but it doesn't matter if it's parameterizations or radiation. I mean, we actually do it just in columns. And because of that, the data structures are a data, single column. And we're moving into a world where we're recognizing the machine, learn, the machine learning algorithms are being provided more data and they're learning that there's actually some value in using the neighbors. And that data may not be available to you in the code. Okay, so we've got to, so that, to, to change that requires a top-down, re, basically restructuring of all the data structures, which is a hard, a hard job. And then, um, well, that was the last point as well. So. That's about problems with the code. There's one more piece in, in the code. There was a common, um, it's, it's very natural when you're adding a parameterization to a model to look at what's already there. And if you want some variable that's already been calculated by somebody else, you use it, right? And uh, I, there was a day when it was in common blocks and it was really easy just to use it. <laughs> but you know, these days, you know, it's still the case that if the variables have been already been diagnosed, you're likely to use it. And when we are building a model to replace something like a vertical mass flux in a, in a turbulent, in a cloud parameterization, you might train your model. You might take the data, create a data set of vertical mass flux and with inputs of, of um, vertical profiles, even with neighbors, learn a model. But when you go to replace the parameterization that, you've, that you're going to replace, you'll discover that there are some other intermediate variables somebody else used. And there's a challenge as to how do we actually keep those variables around? Do we have to go back and relearn that we have to learn those as well? Do we use the old parameterization and the machine learning? Would they be consistent? So there's a few questions there about how to go about solving that problem. And then there's also the issue that there are actual real physical interactions. These are meant to be there, where, there are where there's a balance between processes. So this is physical balances. And if you change, um, if you make one uh, parameterization better because the previous parameterization wasn't doing a good job, you upset that balance and that's going to lead to a, you know, a big adjustment in your model. And this is the sort of thing that's behind what we've called compensating errors. Compensating errors basically means we have a very big complex system. Everybody did their best and then somebody came and put it all together, optimized things, balanced out errors against each other to get the, to get the top of the atmosphere to be zero for an equilibrium solution. So it's very, very common that even, even now, machine learning aside, it's very common that if you come along and improve a parameterization, the model might look worse, even though the physics might be better represented. So this is an issue that we really have to be worried about. And um, it takes, well, I mean, the discussion we had today about um, parameter optimization, it's very relevant there. And there are other solutions. So more, moving more to some details about machine learning online. It's very, it's happened a few times now. We heard about it uh, this, mo um, this morning, or at least this afternoon, um, that you can train a model and it looks great offline, but when you put it online, it's not always stable. And you know, th there's some questions as to why that is, and we can do some analysis and talk about effective eigenvalues and we, um, live conflict experiments and so on. And you know, there's, I mean, every scheme is gonna be different in this regard. Um, it, I was at um, coffee, we were just talking about this. I mean, you just don't know a priori what your network's going to do, right? You don't know whether it's a damping type mode, a diffusive type mode, a transport type mode, or a growing mode, fast mode, slow mode. And so in, in numerical analysis, we know what to do if we know what the dynamics is. We would say, well, you have to use an implicit scheme, it's really fast. You don't have to worry about anything if it's a damping mode and so on. Um, so we know what to do, what to do if we knew what the process are, but when it's a black box, it's a bit risky to say what the right solution is. To make it a bit more complicated, 
you know, to make matters worse, as it were, GCMs use all this numerical analysis and knowledge about what the kind of dynamics they're solving are, and they use a whole mishmash of schemes. So it's not even obvious where you should put your parameterization if it has got mixed modes. Um, so it's just a concern. I actually think that it's not going to be so much of a problem. And we saw this morning um, some examples of, of how using constraints and symmetries um, can actually stabilize things. And there's a recent paper in our group uh, from Yanni Yaval et al, where they've actually done exactly that, where using constraints on the learning process produce something that's stable, whereas previously it had not been. So, so this is just the one concern, um, probably not something that's intractable. Um, although related to that is the issue of stability. So, um, this is, uh, so this is from um, uh, Lausanne's paper in 2020, where she was modeling uh, the subgrid scale momentum accelerations, which uh, she showed you, so showed you some uh, a summary of earlier. And there's a comparison here between um, the gray dot I don't know if I can get my pointer up here or not. Um, this gray dot here, which is a high resolution model, and then several schemes. So we have, what we have here in red is a theory derived parameterization. And in yellow we have, I'm sorry, in yellow we have the theory derived parameterization. In red we have the equation discovery um, um, model. And in, in purple here we have the, the neural network, the data driven neural network. And what this axis down here on the bottom right here is a fudge factor politely called an attenuation factor um, that multiplies the scheme when it's put online. And the first thing to note is it doesn't go up to 100%. They had to scale back all of the schemes, otherwise they wouldn't work. And that as a result, uh, and, and so, so basically that, you know, they literally go off the scale if you go too, too high up, and that they all have different um, levels at which they start failing. Um, so this is, this is an aspect that happens also in conventional parameterizations that you can train, you, not train, I'm sorry, that's one word. You can create a, a, a parameterization based on theory and data and say this is what the coefficient of whatever diffusivity might be. And then you put it into a model and you discover that you need to make it, make it different. Normally we make things larger, um, is my, my experience. The reasons for this are plentifold, but I think the primary ones are that the the resolve gradients are um, in the in the coarse resolution model are imperfect, but there's also a possibility that there is a lack of feedback when you're doing the offline um, training, um, which may or may not be uh, might matter for your parameterizations. Another aspect of this, um, oh, I'll come back to the next slide. So, um, so but but the bottom line here is that we're very used to to retuning a parameterization in the context of a GCM, which is um, well, it's just a fact of life. We always do that. So we um, looked, we saw um, some uh, CNNs earlier today, and this is um, again from this um, Zana uh, Bolton 2020 paper, where they developed that CNN, which you just saw, which was the best performing of those models. And this here is the stencil of the, um, the U and V component vectors of, you know, of velocity, so these little arrows here, on a grid in an, in an ocean model that actually are needed by this four layer convolutional network with three by three um, uh, filters. And it's you, all of these points just to get the acceleration that this red, 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 the red arrow there in the center. So when I look at that, I say, that's a lot. That's a big stencil, but we can manage it because it's actually only four cells and we can, we can use those sort of, we kind of use third order methods that use that many, much data for transport anyway. So we can just about get away with that. But if you go to the more recent work by Law, Law's group with um, Arthur Graham and in 21, they use seven layers. The first two are five by five, next ones are three by three. And that adds another, I think it's eight columns and rows around it. And now we're talking about something that's basically as wide as this wall. It's off, the, it's off the chart. And there's no way that all of our infrastructures are set up for sending that much data. The reason I say no way is that we are used to um, decomposing, there's a kind of an optimal size in terms of work for a CPU, which is around somewhere 15 to 20 points if you've got 100, 100 levels in the vertical. It's just the amount, it's based on memory. And so we don't set up infrastructures to be able to send 100 points in, in either direction. So we are able to do extremely wide CNNs, at least with the MPI infrastructures that we're using right now. 
And so this is something which I'm worried about. And related to the sense of size is the issue of band conditions. So all the training was done in an idealized model and they very carefully, sensibly, uh, avoided um, anything close to the boundaries of their model because it wasn't doing, doing so well, is my understanding. It's the kind of, um, I forget the exact words they used, but basically they, they avoided the, the edges. And in the real world, we have these, not only do we have boundaries, but they're irregular. And, you, and the number of combinations of, of the shapes of boundary in a sense all this wide is just almost uncountable. We can work it out if you wanted. I'm not going to ever try doing that. But you, know, you couldn't set up enough test experiments where you train a model with all the correct shapes. So we need to figure out how to actually um, learn it if you do want to do some learning, set up this data. The solution that they use right now is basically just to not do any training near the boundary and to zero, it, zero out the tendencies. And zero padding is a, a, it's a very, common, um, very common solution in CNNs and it does kind of work. And I think it works partly because you know, doing nothing generally is better than doing something if it's wrong, right? So that's, that's, that's a reasonable, reasonable way out, but it's not necessarily right. And in the ocean, the boundaries make a huge difference. Um, uh, we have Western boundary currents. We have our strongest gradients right up against the boundaries. So doing something at the boundaries explicitly is probably going to be needed if you want to improve our models. Now, on this note, the same paper which was evaluating the theory um, and the CNN and the equation discovery, the equations, the theory, the theory based equations and the discovered equations, both are expressed in terms of quantities which are physical, potentially, but also as a result, also have a very much more finite stencil. And so from an implementation point of view, I'm all of a sudden very excited about this because I don't have to worry quite so much about sending you know, huge amounts of data around, around the, um, uh, the model. So, so there is a, this, is one other, this is another advantage of the, the equation discovery, not just that it's gonna be more interpretable, but in fact, implementation in a parallel sense is going to be significantly easier. The other aspect is that um, when it's a physical quantity, I do actually know how to apply a boundary condition. Whereas I didn't know how to do that in an arbitrary sense of CNN, right? So this is, this is something to consider. It's another, yet another motivation for let's, ch let's chase after finding the equations using machine learning rather than stopping at the networks. There is a caveat to this. Um, sometimes we might know the physical boundary condition, but it's not obvious that the, the, parameter, the, the, the machine learned parameterization was using a quantity for the right reason, or rather that we thought it was. For example, the divergence is you know, du dx plus dv dy in, in Cartesian space. And it might have chosen that because of what it really wanted was um, du, du dx. Um, let me think of it, uh, sorry. It might have wanted, um, uh, oh, sorry, two times du dx minus a, plus a dv dy. I'm trying, I'm getting my math, math messed, up, messed up. My point is simply that it might be a component of these physical values which it actually wanted in different combinations because you see that it's recombining things like zeta plus minus d. And, and it, we can apply boundary conditions on things we understand, but we need to check that the networks actually are doing the same thing in those boundary areas that, that we want. We do have to do some training, I think, with boundaries and learn, figure out what they're doing there as the bottom line. Okay, so one last thing about the equation discovery is um, I think another, another compelling reason for going off this equation, equation discovery is their efficiency. So, you know, we, we appreciate that GPUs are really good at high arithmetic. Uh, in, high, highly, highly intense arithmetic, um, which is what ne neural networks are. And, uh, but uh, nevertheless, evaluating a single term like x squared or x times y is a lot cheaper than evaluating a network, no matter whether you're on a CPU or a, net or a GPU. So over here is an evaluation of the performance of various schemes. On the right is had had a really high resolution model, which was a, the training data set. And on the left over here, this um, 30 kilometer green box is the course resolution model without any prioritization. And the implementation of either the theory or the equation discovery is barely a blip in terms of the cost of that model, which is very typical. It's very often the case that adding a prioritization does not change the speed cost of your model very much. It normally adds a few percent, partly because our models are so big. The neural network approach, on the other hand, added 
a significant amount of time. It went from five hours to, to a day, which is, what is that, four, four times more expensive. And so now this is, this is, a, this is a like with like comparison because all of this was evaluated on the CPU. So that's just about how much work you are doing in a neural network relative to the, you know, you having a, an equation to solve. So this is um, just uh, an anecdote, but it basically does, does say if, if we can find the equations, it makes sense that it will be a more, a more efficient way to actually implement things. And of course, equations we can interpret and understand. So I'm just gonna quickly uh, just show you that there are three um, active projects which we're actually implementing at this time. I apologize, you know, we literally just got going. Uh, we have not got um, solutions yet with the real GCMs, but we are working now, this very minute, implementing these in GCMs. And a lot of what I've just told you about is really a summary of the, the, um, the hurdles that basically these, these ECRs, these early career researchers, came up against. They literally rediscovered all these problems that we could have warned them about and we've been having to help them you know, work their way through all these issues that, we've, that, that I just listed. So I'm going to quickly discover, uh, describe some ocean, the ocean hull and momentum closures that Law partly introduced, what well, did introduce this morning. Talk about a uh, slide on atmospheric convection and also a boundary layer scheme. So the, uh, this was introduced by Law, so I shan't um, dwell on this. But basically the idea is to use high resolution models to define, thank you, going to be perfect, um, to, to diagnose uh, subgrid scale horizontal momentum accelerations. And uh, we're using, this is both in bio, a shallow water model, a biotropic model, and a biotonic model uh, using the MIT GCM. And so the diagnosing those, they've managed to show, this is the results we showed earlier, that there you can improve a coarse resolution model, which is the top left, to look like the fine resolution model a lot better using either equation discovery or the neural networks on the right. I've highlighted in the top left there, the fine resolution has um, a strong zonal current along the boundary, which none of the other models have. And that is speculated in the paper, and I think it's probably right, that's the boundary effect that was missing because they were zeroing out. They were doing zero padding and they weren't training at the boundary. So that's what I mean by we need to do something about the boundary. We need to actually make sure we're doing some training, do something different, at least think about it and figure it out um, at the boundary. So that's, that's, um, uh, that's just some evidence that that's something we have to take into account. And this is again, the same problem, the same models we've got. Again, we've got the theory, um, the theory of driven moment, the equation discovery and the CNNs compared to the high resolution on the left there. And this is just a demonstration that there is um, benefit. There's something, something happening in the equation discovery, but it's actually doing a great job in terms of spatial coverage, but the CNN is doing better in a lot of the oceans. So there's, this, you know, this is a much darker deep red here down here in the bottom right in terms of its skill at, re at, cal at um, calculating the actual uh, fluxes. So although that there's no white, less white or blue over in the theory, in the equation discovery, that the region of coverage is much better there. So, so it's, not, it's not clear to me yet whether the equation discovery can, does always do as well. It does, the question is whether it does well enough, I think is at this point, um, one of the questions we have to have. The atmospheric convection, so this has led uh, work from um, Paula Goldman and Pierre Jontin's group, and Yanni Yavel has been doing all of the hard work here. And so they've developed, and, and this is, you know, this is not yet a full GCM. This is a, a, a essentially an aqua planet, SPCAM, but they have demonstrated that they can take this high resolution approach, high resolution, develop a, a, a machine learned model of the fluxes in the vertical. In this case, they've, they've produced um, something that does a very good job, um, both in terms of accuracy and stability for both neural networks and for um, random forests, which is, I think, some earlier on, they were, the, they were um, some of the ones who were trying to think about how to sort out the stability. They've, they've actually managed to get there, and they've got there by enforcing um, constraints, conservation constraints. So that one step seems to have been the key for them to actually get to a stable solution. Okay, so that's uh, atmospheric convection. I, I'm not dwelling on it because I'm not the expert there. And then finally, the, th the third scheme that we, we hope to be implementing, well, we are implementing literally now. And um, I'm really excited about this because it's gonna, be, it's gonna go very fast, um, is a parameterization to, that is 
is address is fixing an issue inside a notion boundary layer scheme that we have. So we already have a boundary layer scheme which we like an awful lot. It was designed to be energetically consistent and it encompasses a whole suite of processes in the, in the ocean boundary layer. Much like the atmospheric boundary layer has lots of processes, so does the ocean. And this boundary layer scheme has, has been doing a great job of actually estimating the integral constraints of the boundary layer. It gets the depth pretty well right because of, based on energetics, it's energy, it uses energetics at its heart. We weren't very interested in replacing this boundary layer scheme wholesale because we would throw away this energetic consistency without doing some extra work, right? Which is the constraints part we've been talking about. But what we do, we can do is actually go in and look at what was wrong inside that. And there are a lot of assumptions, one of which is traditional about the vertical structure of the diffusivity, the shape profiles within the scheme. And so we've been training based on um, uh, K-epsilon models and LES uh, for what, to, to, to recover that shape function. And the networks are doing really well. And the news I got this morning by Slack channel is that even in the model, it's making a good difference. So, so that's, that's really good news. So this is, this is another implementation, which I think will be um, coming out soon. So within my time, I summarized quickly the, the MSC guidelines project was, was going after the big deal, which is actually getting these things into, machine, into um, climate models. Um, and there are quite a few issues to take into account. And so what, when I said, you know, this is not just an afterthought at the end of the project of having trained your models. We need to take these things into account as we're going through this. But, you know, we have to, there's fairy aspects that, that we need to be uh, aware of when we're actually doing the machine learning part of the offline training. And, um, and then we have, a, have an indication, I think we have a general theme that we think that the equation discovery is definitely the right way to go if we can. And so that's, uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Much, Alistair. Uh, questions or comments for Alistair? Edwin. Thanks for the, the great presentation. Uh, so you mentioned three models at the beginning. So is it the idea, especially for CNN, to develop a parameterization for each model, or you think you can use so, one parameterization that works for all of them? Yeah, so, so the thing is that those models are actually made of, of components, and this is, you know, there's a lot of... Um, Structure in this diagram. We, uh, each of those models is, is I've li listed, I've shown them there as four components: an atmosphere, land, ocean, ice, and sea ice and ocean. And if you look at it, there is no one model that we have all the components of addressed. So we have representatives from each of these components, which are inside the dash boxes. What isn't here is actually the future. So this is this is where we are now. There is actually going to be a, a climate model in in a, in, a, in two or three years' time, which actually has has been built out of components we are, have representatives of. In, in, in all components. The only th we're not addressing land, so we aren't doing land in this project, um, which is you know, the way it is. But um, so we have mom six and myself, and this is two, uh, size, we've got represented by NCAR, Marika Holland, um, and then um, the CAM, we've got uh, Paula Goldman and Judith Burnham and um, uh, Pierre Jantin and so on. So, so we, have, we have representatives who, for the future model, but developing these parameterizations to work in the components is the first step. Now you don't you don't build a parameterization, throw it, throw it straight at the full climate model. You evaluate it in the components, you make sure it's working in the components, you do your evaluation quickly in, you know, in, in some test setup with the components. Then you add it to, a, to an existing climate model that you have. And you don't have to have, I don't have to have an expert in AM4 in order to figure out whether my AD parameterization is doing a better job in, in the climate model. And then in two or three years time, we'll be bringing it all together. Anish. Yeah, thanks again for the great talk. I was wondering if, like, the details of the numerics of your high-resolution simulations, like if it's finite volume versus finite element or B grid versus C grid, does that matter for the training of the machine learning, um, like output tendencies? I think um, so. This is a general question for all of us. I think the answer is um, as long as it's um, as long as the numerics are well, well, you know, well behaved and convergent, if you are doing a high, a, a high resolution model, you should be resolving the, the, the part of the cascade that you all expect that you need to. The question is not about the high resolution model, it's about the low resolution model. Then, you know, if you have a really poor numerics in your low resolution model, that might be dominating the difference between 
your solution and the truth, right? And you know, you're, when you're when you're learning parameterization, is the difference. You're probably correcting the bad numerics. So, so I think the question should be targeted at the low resolution models. And we were discussing this at lunch, and um, I think Rob, you were there. I forget who asked him. Uh, oh yeah, Pedram. And so, you know, I think I think it makes. It, it, I think that's actually where we need to be thinking about whether we should be actually readdress, addressing the, the, the numerics and the low resolution models. And in fact, that's exactly the point that Law, Law said in the introduction to her talk. I mean, that's part of what needs to be corrected with the machine learning, perhaps. Uh, yeah, in the back, if you could come to the microphone, sorry, so people can hear. Great talk. Uh, so there's a slide uh, somewhere in between where you show that the tensile size of your convolution kernel affects how your memory scales in the model or how data is being transferred. You mentioned that the larger stencil size sort of affects it. Could you clarify that a little bit more? Do you want me to put it up? Yeah. 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 Could you clarify why this it's is going to affect the you know, how your so, memory so scales? So, so the way I'm looking at I'm looking at this from an MPI point of view, which is not necessarily appropriate if we if we had already moved on to GPUs. So it's a slightly different problem. Um, but conventionally, what we do right now is we tile up the model and then we, we copy the data from all of your neighbors into a halo around the computational part of your array. That's a conventional solution. I think everyone uses it now for, for, for regular grid models, at least. So I appreciate on structured models, this is a different, different problem. So that's the conventional approach. The width of that halo needs to be relatively, not small, but it, ha it can't be so large that it's the dominant part of the size of the array. Otherwise, all of your memory is spent on copies and making this transfers and copies. I mean, so, so there's a, there's a trade-off between how wide that computational part is versus the width of that halo. The width of that halo is determined by the stencils in your operators. So currently, if you're using a third or fourth order method, you might have three or four points that you need in order to calculate, you know, a transport or something like that. You can um, do, you can make the, the, the halo narrower by doing more frequent communication, but that's demonstrated to be a slower way to do things. I mean, sending, generally we have high bandwidth these days. Um, so you send, you send larger packets. And so we have, you know, we have as wide a halo as necessary to do all of the, the computation and then send fewer, fewer packets, fewer synchronization points. So that's the strategy we use right now. If I added a, you know, 20, so let's, let's just say that my optimal size for the computational domain is 20 points with, with a halo of four around it. So my, domain, my, my arrays are now 28, four on either side, right? 28 squared. If I add a stencil that's 20 points, that means I need an extra 16. I've now, I can't even do the math in my head on the, on the fly, but I think I've done more than doubled by a lot. Um, the size of those arrays just to do that one operation. And the, the cost of sending that information is extreme. As you know, I mean, mem the, you know, <laughs> accessing memory is the slowest part on a computer right now. True also for GPUs. So, so that's what I mean is we you know we, 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 right now we've, we've built codes and our algorithms which take advantage of, take a, have designed to not send too much information, rely on sending too much information. And the CNN with the wide stencil breaks that, and that's what I'm concerned about. Okay, thanks. Any other questions for Alistair? Yes, please. Alistair, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry if this is a too much of a technical question, but I think in one of your last slides, you showed some of the work that Brandon is doing, mm -hmm. and you said that you're gonna train it with LES. Uh, I saw some waves there. Uh, do, you, do you happen to know if the Stokes drift is prescribed and if the overall idea is sort of like looking at a big picture is to run this coupled with a wave model? In, in um, the okay, so the plans are right now we have, we don't have um, in our routine model, we don't have a coupled surface wave model. What we do have is a parameterized surface wave model. So we have a parameterization of the surface waves and then we have a parameterization of the effect of Stokes drift on the boundary layer. So that parameterization you know, the wind-driven search drift part of it is actually a parameterization that's already there. That was trained against LES, um, when I say trained, conventional trained. <laughs> um, 
the, but there is, uh, Brandon is actually actively coupling to an actual surface wave model uh, um, from um, EMC, and um, that's WaveWatch 3. And so there will be a direct coupling between those. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure that we'll have to revisit all of the, the transitions when we have a real, mo a real model with a full proper spectrum in the waves. Okay, any final questions for Alistair? I think we still have two minutes, so I wanted to go back a little bit maybe to the compensating errors and how to tune parameters, right? So I think even if we go with equation discovery, we still end up with things to tune. Right. So what do you think? I mean, and same same as so, Katie mentioned, is some of the parameters might actually not be something that we know or... So we can, we can come at this um, from a mathematical point of view and let's and start talking about projects like the uh, effort coming out of France high tune or the ensemble camera filter parameter optimization. So there is a there is a there is a strategy where we can just you know, apply math to this problem, but that requires applying some math to the problem <laughs> and doing some hard work. I've just come out of um, a whole eight year cycle where we developed a climate model. And what we used was that kind of institutional knowledge about how to build models. And I think it's hard for me to see how we're going to not rely on that, at least for the next round. Not when I say round, I mean for the next, you know, for the, for the life cycle of this, you know, this sort of project where we're trying to apply some machine learning. So I think that we are going to be relying on the expertise, which is in the form of working groups at the centers. Those working groups are very, very used to looking at the effect of a parameterization on their solutions and at looking at how to bring the whole model together in a, in a balanced state, to retune re the model to get TOA back to where they went, where they needed, TOA being the top of the atmosphere radiation balance. So you know, there's a lot of expertise, which, um, which I think it exists. We can't ignore, we shouldn't ignore it since it's there. Um, the real question is to make sure that we can demonstrate to them that we've got something worth looking at. But, being on one of those working groups, <laughs> I'm going to be easy to convince. All right. Can I, can I just highlight something that you're talking a little bit about two different problems. And one of them is how do you tune a parameterization against the data that you have? And so that's yes. the problem, for example, that's addressed by high tune. I, I just want to say this because I think that may not be obvious to everyone in the audience. So when you were talking about the behavior of, of a specific process or a specific component of the model, you're gonna tune that to the best data that you have available, observational data, high resolution data, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. There's a separate step that you're also talking about, which is the um, finding a configuration, a retuning of the oh, model the that gives the emergent, makes the climate system, the emergent behavior of the entire climate system um, acceptable according to some institutionally, institutional memory defined yeah. um, metric or set of metrics. And there, I just want to point out that they're different steps. They definitely are. And that they have different um, outcomes. And that a model, uh, a sub-model, or a parameterization, which is well-tuned and in great agreement with, I'm just highlighting exactly the thing you said at the beginning. Um, it's in great agreement with you know, the observations and the physics that we know um, may still degrade the model performance and would require the tuning of the entire modeling system. I agree with everything you said. You're absolutely right. Did you want to say anything else on this? So, no. Yeah. No, no. Uh, spot on. We can improve model physics, but yeah. we might not reduce the bias. We might make it worse. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's what you mm. said at the beginning. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much, Alistair. Ah, oh, final one. Oh, yes. One quick and then uh, Anish, if you want to start. But, no, it's just uh, it, going back to, to the comment, the way you stated it, it was very clear. But are we really gaining from saying we still have to tune everything again? or maybe just going to a system that has issues and is not as nice as the one we had, but where we have a better control of the physics, or at least, the, I, you know, sometimes I think that you tend to repeat the same problems over and over. I, okay, so I think that we are maybe over-concerned about this retuning exercise. I mean, uh, there is value in better representation of the physics. There are feedbacks represented by that physics that if you have it wrong, how, how do we really trust what we're doing with these models? You know, if we had a diffusive scheme where it should be a, a, an energizing transport scheme, you know, why, why do we trust the models when we, when we got the physics wrong? So this is, so I think improving the physics has got to be the first acknowledgement. We have to improve the physics when we know it's wrong. That's, 
that's what we're doing first. And so after that, everything has to follow from that from that starting point. So if you have to retune, you know, that's that's just the cost of doing doing business, I think. And we'll we know we've done it before, we'll carry on doing it. It's 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 ugly, <laughs> it's painful and expensive, but you know, it has to be done for the model to be use, usable. But we have improved the physics. That's the bonus. That's the right thing to do, in my opinion. Now. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I could not agree more. Thank you very much, Alistair. I think I'll speak here again.